Welcome back to another video this is a part 11 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 41, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 41, End of Golden Week Part 2. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Dining Room. Era, oh before you sit down, one moment, please. Yasaka moved the chair intended for Issei, closer toward her own. Looking back and smiling, Yasaka pointed toward the seat. Ah yes, there we are, much better. Rubbing the back of his bed head styled hair, Issei smiled and proceeded to sit down. Shortly after, the fox queen handed a plate that she had recently prepared toward her husband. She did this in a very graceful manner which would be indicative of a classic and traditional Japanese married woman. As this was going on, Seraphal sat down on the opposite side of the table as Kuno excitedly brought her auntie a cup of tea. Both girls had warm smiles on their faces, however Seraphal's features showed signs of slight fatigue. After Kuno finished what she was doing, she darted toward the other side of the table and proceeded to sit down on the chair that was on the other side of a now-eating Issei. Hi, Issei looked toward the fox princess and smiled. Hi, yourself, what's up, kiddo, well, Mom said that you are going back to Kuo tomorrow morning, so I was wondering if maybe, Kuno was cut off by Issei as he instantly began to pat the little girl's head. We should go fishing, Issei said this very matter-of-factly. Remembering how much fun he had, fishing with his father when he was around Kuno's age, Issei thought it might be fun to take advantage of Yusaka's gigantic back garden. Kuno raised an eyebrow as the fox princess grew an overwhelming smile. I've always wanted to go fishing with, Instantly, the fox child froze as her eyes widened suddenly. Yasaka showed a soft frown of concern for her daughter, knowing full well what she was thinking at the moment. Issei wasn't blind-eyed to these gestures, especially when it came to little Kuno. Maybe the kid has always wanted to have the chance to spend a day fishing with her father. Is that why she is hesitating, why she looks a bit sad all of the sudden? Damn my ancestor, he should've stuck it out for a little longer, for her sake. Yasaka, would it be alright if Kuno and I did some catch and release? Issei kept his attention on both girls as he maintained a warm smile. Kuno now turned her attention toward her mother with a pleading gesture. Mommy, it's fishing, Yasaka thought for a moment as she placed one of her hands against her face while showing her signature half-crescent smile. Hmm, well, I suppose. However, you aren't going out like that. After breakfast, Please put on something appropriate for getting dirty. And Issei. Yasaka turns her gaze back onto her husband as her smile turns into a sudden smirk. After you're finished, please join me in my bedroom. Seraphal shot two thumbs up as she smiled brightly. Wow, you're not a fox, you're a cougar. Roar. Hee hee hee. Yasaka giggles into her sleeve. Era era. Sarah Chan. You embarrass an old woman. Era era. But to be honest, I was only planning to take him with me to Beppu, Oida. Seraphal nods in all seriousness. Oh, that place, I see. Well, I am sure he will enjoy it. Issei raises his hand into the air. Ahem, what place are you talking about, Milky, Yasaka? Yakasa takes her hand from the side of her face and places it against Issei's. Beppu happens to be one of my favorite hot springs. In fact, I love it so much that I bridged a gateway for easy travel. Blushing from Yasaka's touch, Issei replies. Oh, a hot spring. You want us to go together at a hot spring. But, um, the teen began to show a nervous look. Era era, it's not like we haven't bathed together before, so I don't understand why you look frightened at the idea. Yasaka showed a playful, frown. Issei shook his head rapidly. I don't think Sona is gonna like that. I won't like what? Everyone in the room jumped a bit as none other than Sona Citri entered through the corridor. S. Sona. Hey. Good morning, hee hee. Issei was now standing at attention. This forced Yasaka's hand from the teen's face which immediately disappointed the fox queen. So Tan, morning sister. Come sit next to me. Seraphal was now patting the chair next to her while winking at her younger sibling. Sona had her usual stoic attitude present and accounted for as she stood quietly with her arms folded. Kuno was looking at the sea tree heiress as she attempted to remember something. Then, it hit her. Good morning, auntie's sister. Also, 
I didn't barge into my aunt's room like you had suggested. Kuno then took another bite of her food while staring back at Sona while blinking a few times. Sona gained a tick mark as her gaze directed at the fox girl. I don't have the slightest clue as to what you are talking about. Sona then showed a victorious smile. Both Issei and Seraphal both tilt their heads while giving each other a nod. Seraphal then grew a small grin. Coercive manipulation of a child. Really now, Sona, I thought you were better than that. Boo. Seraphal was still facing Issei as her back was still toward her younger sister. She then playfully blinked back toward Kuno. Wow, you just couldn't stand the fact that your big sis was spending her rightful time with Issei here. Come now, Sona, really. Nervously adjusting her glasses, Sona did her best to not look directly at her sister, who was smiling like usual. I don't have the slightest of clues as to what you are implying, Sarah Tan. Ah ha, Sarah Fall was now pointing to her now shocked looking sister. You called me Sarah Tan. That means you are trying to butter my biscuits while attempting to change the subject, entirely. Sona was now turning a few shades of red. While this was happening, Issei felt a tug on his shirt. Looking downward, the teen noticed little Kuno staring back at him. With her large golden eyes, she motioned with them, focusing on the back entrance of the castle, leading to the large backyard. Understanding what the little fox princess wanted, Issei turned his attention toward Yusaka. Leaning in a bit, as to keep what he was about to tell his wife private. I think now would be a great time to take Kuno fishing, you know, while the sisters are distracted. Yasaka winked and proceeded to kiss her husband on his cheek. This made Issei blush intensely and at the same time, got the attention of both Sona and Seraphal. Now standing at attention, the teen nervously rubbed the back of his head. Meanwhile, Kuno, who was still sitting in her seat next to Issei, proceeded to, once again, tug on the teen's shirt. Looking back down, Issei's eyes met Kuno's. Noticing that the little fox princess was beyond excited, just from the glimmer in her golden eyes, Issei couldn't help but melt into putty. Now returning his attention toward the small group of women who were all staring at him, Issei cleared his throat. So, I am going to take Princess Kuno out to the stream in the gardens and do some catch and release. Issei now nodded to himself with a bit of pride. Seeing Issei's reaction to all of this, Seraphal, Sona and even Yusaka couldn't help but blush at the paternal situation unfolding right in front of their very eyes. Before a response could be made, Kuno proceeded to dash from the dinner table and blur toward the main hallway. Can somebody get me a fishing pole? I want a real elite kind of pole too. Like, professional and all. Wait, make that too. Yay, fishing with Papa. As the golden blur disappeared off into the corridor, a very familiar laugh began to take. Over the dining room, foo 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 foo, era, era, Issei, oh my, jumping from her own seat, Yusaka proceeded to tackle a confused Issei, wrapping all nine of her tails around the team. Seen later on, Yusaka Gardens, Koi Pond. Sitting on a stone bench, both little Kuno and Issei are holding poles out toward the nearby water. Both father and daughter had their bare feet in the cool water as the warm sun cast its vibrance across the beautiful garden. In a comfortable leaning position, Issei proceeded to pull back his line and get ready for a recast. You know, I don't think I've been fishing since I was about your age, kiddo. Gotta say, it's relaxing. Kuno was looking straight ahead and at the water. She had a warm smile on her face as she worked her fishing pole with absolute seriousness. So, you got to do this, with your papa. Oh, nodding. Issei casted his line out far into the pond. Yeah, he's a good guy. We also camped a lot. Sometimes mom would stay home because she didn't like the idea of getting dirty. Ha ha ha. If they didn't have an actual bathroom with a shower, she'd flat out refuse to come. Kuno was now staring back at the reminiscing and smiling Issei as he giggled to himself. Kuno's smile slowly began to fade away. Yeah. That sounds really great. I wonder if that's how mine would have been, my real dad. Feeling a sudden sting toward his own soul, Issei immediately turned his attention back and toward the fox princess. Seeing a vacant expression on Kuno's face, Issei thought quickly. Kuno was about to tear up, that was until she felt a soft and caressing pat to her head. Looking up, the princess saw Issei's smiling face and his warm brown eyes, looking back at her. Hey now. I'm her dad now. Besides, 
your firm other dad is actually an ancestor of mine so that makes it official same blood runs through my veins well kinda so yeah isei nodded to himself while continuing to pat the discombobulated kuno on her head instantly isei felt pressure in his mid and chest section it happened so quickly that the teen's eyes could barely keep up kuno now had both of her little arms around isei while her head was buried in his gray yukata Muffled cries were being heard and Issei couldn't help but feel a few tears of his own, escaping their place within his eyes. Issei returned the hug and tried to keep his own emotions from escaping his own lips. Don't worry kiddo, even though I'm heading back to Ku, I'm kind of a devil. So, visiting won't be an issue, well, once I figure out how to use teleportation circles. Since your mom gave me magic, well, I guess I should have it down quickly. Issei was looking up at the cloudless sky. Leaning back a bit, Kuno looked up at Issei and spoke with a warm smile. Can I visit your house in Kuo? Issei looked downward and at the princess while nodding. Sure can. In fact, your grandparents live there, so it's almost like your other home. I hope that makes sense, haha. <laughs> Kuno closed one of her eyes while holding out her pinky. You promise, Papa Kun. Without hesitation, Issei locked his pinky around little Kuno's. I promise, my home in Kuo is your home. Kuno opened her shut eye while smiling brightly. Okay, it's a promise. Let's catch some fish. We haven't caught anything yet. Issei nodded while looking back and toward the quiet pond. Tilting his head, Issei had to question this pond. Say, Kuno, do all of the ponds have fish in them? Kuno tilted her own head and thought for a moment. Well, to be honest, I don't think I've seen any fish in this pond for a while now. But I swear, there used to be. How strange. Then, as if on cue, both Issei and Kuno nodded at the strange and fishless pond in front of them. Scene unknown location. NYA, yummy. Kuroka, was sitting up on the large bed eating what looked to be grilled fish. Meanwhile, sitting next to Kuroka was Ophis. Also eating what looked to be grilled fish, the infinite dragon god simply nodded. Chapter 42, Sona's Chance a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 42, End of Golden Week Part 3. Scene, Yasaka Castle. Thank you again, for spending your time with me, Papa Kuno. Kuno makes a slight bow and proceeds to remove her shoes. Smiling warmly, Issei scratched the back of his head. Anytime. I had fun. You have a really pretty home, Kuno. Placing her shoes in the cubby, the fox princess turns her head and frowns a bit. Our home, Papa, it's our home, right? Nodding immediately, Issei made a goofy gesture. You're right, kiddo, I guess my hungry stomach is making me forgetful. The teen then comically grabbed for his own midsection while making fake grumpling sounds with his mouth. Kuno's frown changed into her usual smile. Oh, yeah, we didn't catch any fish to eat. I guess we should find mommy and maybe she can make us lunch. Issei couldn't help but laugh at Kuno's gesture regarding actually eating a koi fish. He he he, well, I bet your mom's cooking is a billion times better than eating large goldfish. Tilting her head for a moment, the fox princess thought about her previous statement. Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. Eating goldfish is something cats do. Issei nodded. Yeah, speaking of, I wonder what happened to all of your fish in the ponds. Kuno shrugs. I swear. Papa Kuhn, there were lots of fish before. Mom makes sure to keep the ponds full. Scene, unknown location. Burp. NYA, I think these fish are really tasty. Grilled to pure affection, Kuroka was chewing on the tailbone of what was left of her meal. Ophis looks at her empty plate and then tilts her head. They got suspicious. We must not be careless in the future. If my plans are found out, prematurely, it will complicate things. Looking toward Ophis, with the fishtail sticking out of her mouth, Kuroka replies. I don't see why you just don't talk to him. You know, get him alone, then talk to him. And if that doesn't work, well, Kuroka then bites the fishtail in half with her extended canine teeth. Then you just take him. Ophis tilts her head while showing the slightest hint of fascination to what Kuroka had declared. Talk to him, Kuroka nods. Yeah, Ophis tilts her head the other way. If talk fails, then take him. Kuroka nods once again. Now you're getting it. NYA. Scene, Kuo Academy. No, 
I hate you. I hate you. Stay away. Bastard. Rius was running at full speed toward the library through the empty hallways. Not far behind her was the phantom camel, who was at full gallop as it grinned maniacally. Rius. Don't go. Come back. Give me some sugar. Rius looked behind her as she continued to run, only to see the drooling and skeletonized camel, gaining momentum. No. Graphia. Help. As the camel got ever so closer toward Rius, it finally managed to reach the Switch Princess's butt with its elongated teeth. Clam. Ouch. Ah. Let go. Let go, bad camel. Rius managed to pull away from the phantom's mouth and proceed to make her way through the twin doors leading toward the library. As she continues to run, the back of her pants are now ripped off completely, exposing her crimson and black panties. Grabbing the end of her rear with both hands, Rius screams out in pain. Ooh -ee. Instantly, the camel stopped its running and came to a complete stop. That was because its prey also stopped running. Turning around and facing the phantom, Rius looked absolutely livid. She was clenching her teeth as her usual blue eyes now exhibited patterns of crimson energy, flowing like clouds of deep red. Both of Rius's arms were extended as her hands were balled into fists. Each clenched fist was also covered in the same cloudy and red energy which continued to intensify with each second passing. The skeletonized camel tilted its malformed head as drool dripped onto the floor from its gaping mouth. Slowly, the demonic animal began to back away as if it were in fear for its own life. How dare you! I am Rius fucking Grimori, you stupid and degenerate CA, CA, camel. Slowly, Rius's arms extended and pointed toward the spooked phantom. Die a thousand deaths, asshole. Blast. Red and crimson energy enveloped the entire hallway with a blinding light. After the flash ended, smoke and debris was all that was left. And eerie silence took over the dusty scene, all that could be heard was the deep breathing of Rius. That's right, bitch, I'm the boss here. Rius was looking scrupulously through the fog of debris, waiting for it to settle enough to see clearly. Did I get him this time? I put almost everything I got into that. Please, please be dead, dead this time. As the fog and smoke cleared, Rius's worried expression turned into that of a grinning madwoman. On the cracked linoleum floor lay what's left of the phantom camel, which was a twitching head and nothing more. Stomping loudly and slowly toward the severed head of her fallen enemy, Rius began to punch one fist into her open palm. Hey now, don't tell me that's all you got. I can see you're still moving. Well then, I suppose we're gonna have a bit of fun, right? The camel skull stopped its twitching movements and proceeded to shake in utter fear. Its large and hollowed eyes focused on its impending doom which was none other than Rius, fucking, Grimori. Scene, Yusaka Castle. The sounds of knocking could be heard against the large and twin rice paper doors of Yusaka's personal quarters. Standing somewhat nervously on the other side of said twin doors was Issei, who recently cleaned up and was wearing a pair of red swimming trunks with a towel wrapped around his neck. Era era, please, enter Issei. Complying. Issei slowly slid one of the doors open and closed it behind him. Turning back around to face his wife, the teen's jaw went completely agape as his eyes widened to the size of watermelons. Oh my, please don't stare too much, you'll make an old woman blush, Era, Yusaka had both of her hands against her blushing cheeks with her eyes tightly held shut. As we back away, we notice why Issei is acting the way he is. Wearing a two-piece black and gold bikini, Yusaka looked as if she would burst out of the very revealing attire at any moment. At further glance, we notice a similar skull pattern toward the yellow parts of the bikini, the very same pattern that adorns her usually yellow sash. Seeing her just standing there, with all of her glory, Issei attempted to look somewhere else, anywhere but found it impossible. Attempting to at least say something, the teen pushed away his perverted tendencies with all of his might. Wa, Erm, Ya, Yusaka. You, you're so beautiful. Issei did the best he could to say something without allowing his lecherous side to take hold. Yasaka twitched one of her ears as her eyes opened suddenly. Her blush remained constant however her golden eyes met with Issei's. You think so, really? Without hesitation, Issei nodded over enthusiastically. You really know how to flatter me. First you take care of my daughter as if she were your own, then you take hold of my heart without holding back. You must truly be his, ancestor. Yusaka was now holding out her hand while smiling warmly. Issei reached out and took hold. Instantly, 
he was pulled into a tight hug. Feeling Yasaka's golden hair against his face, Issei heard the Fox Queen whisper quietly into his ear. Are you, ready? It's going to feel a bit strange. This isn't like using devil magic. We are going to be traversing a ley line. It's a special bridge of sorts that only I can make. But, since you are not quite a spirit-based entity, such as myself, you must stay close, like this. Don't let go, for any reason. Do you understand, my husband? Yasaka slowly began to manipulate her tails and wrap them around Issei. Got it, so just hug you then. Issei wrapped his arms around Yasaka's midsection. Tight as you can, darling. Yasaka then began to clear her throat. The room began to darken suddenly as the Fox Queen began to recite her mantra. Tenshi no Rei Man Yo, Watashi no Kotoba o Kiite Kudasai. Watashi no Michio Azuma Kara Nishi e, Kita Kara Minami e Sunide Kudasai. Watashi no Michio Meikaku Katsu Shinjitsu ni Shite Kudasai. Oitaken Bepushi. Once Yusaka's mantra ended, Issei could swear the oxygen within his lungs was somehow taken against his will. Aside from the immense warmth of Yusaka, the dark space in which he was existing was cold and void of any life. Pushing his face deeper into the Fox Queen's neck, Issei found it possible to breathe once again, though he could only produce very shallow breaths also. The strange feeling of this void became more and more overwhelming the longer he stayed here. Daring not to move from where his face lay, Issei was wanting to look up at Yusaka but knew better of it. As the darkness became increasingly suffocating, a bright flash took over this voided realm. Era era, well, that was a quick trip. Oh my, Issei, are you alright? Yusaka was now standing over a kneeling Issei, who was coughing and gasping for air. Oh my. Just take a deep breath and slowly let it out, yes that's it. Good. Once the fogginess cleared in his head, Issei slowly took both of Yusaka's hands and stood back up. After a moment, the team looked around and got a better look at his surroundings. The air smelled of sulfur which was rich with steam. In front of the couple was a large and natural hot spring filled with berry blue colored water. A very large cloud of vapor hovered above the almost glowing cobalt liquid. Beyond the water was a traditional black-colored wooden fence which held in the natural vegetation and rock formations. Aside from that, green trees and rolling hills with mountains surrounded the landscape with random clouds of mist in the distance. Oh, wow, Yusaka, this place is amazing. Issei began to feel excited about the situation. Then, suddenly, the Fox Queen let go of the teen's hands which got his attention. Looking back at his wife, Yusaka had her back to Issei while glancing behind with a deep blush. Suddenly, the queen of the yokai began to remove her bikini top. Issei's jaw, once again, goes agape. Chapter 43, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 43, End of Golden Week Part 4. Scene, Beppu, Oida. Wow, this really is relaxing. I think I understand why this is one of your favorite places. I could live here. We now see Issei, leaning back against a smooth rock formation with a small and damp towel against his head. Panning out, we are able to notice this large and vibrant hot spring with water as blue as the sky itself. Through all of the large clouds of steam and mist, it's clear that this spring is completely vacant, aside from Yusaka and Issei. The queen of the yokai was leaning against the same large stone that her husband was. She was wearing her golden yellow and black two-piece bikini along with a matching damp towel, also against her head. Like Issei, the nine-tailed vixen was in a relaxed state with her golden eyes looking up into the steamy sky. Era, I am glad that you understand. Yes, I've come to this place for decades upon decades. In fact, Kuno's father rather enjoyed the springs. He said that these very waters would calm his nerves whenever he felt downtrodden. So, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised regarding your reaction, Issei-kun. Yasaka turns her attention toward her left and at Issei. Sweetheart, there's something I want to tell you. I know that you are concerned about this Rias Grimori devil. Issei's expression changes from his relaxed state to something akin to paranoia. Um, yeah, to be honest, it scares the hell out of me. I don't know what I'll say. I don't know what she'll say. But, she really did a number on me, you know. And then there's the peerage. I mean, I haven't known any of them that long but Akino and Kiba seem to like me. Kaneko, well, hee hee, that's a whole other story. 
that girl straight up hates my very existence. Then there's Asia, she's erm, complicated, but yeah, I just figured they are going to be pissed at me, for all of the stuff I did. Staring forward at nothing in particular, Issei thought for a moment with a solemn look. Yasaka nods slowly while her eyes begin to close. She continues to smile warmly and takes a deep breath. Issei suddenly notices the feeling of something warm, warmer than the hot spring water, covering every inch of his body. With the warmth came along with it this overwhelming feeling of calmness, so much so, one might consider this feeling intoxicating. Opening her eyes, Yusaka places one of her hands on Issei's face while directing his attention onto her. As the very confused and relaxed teen focuses on Yusaka's golden eyes, the Fox Queen speaks in a soft and warm voice. They won't be mad at you, sweetheart. If anything, I am sure they will understand. Let's just say that I'm a mother and can sense these kinds of things. Also, Issei, I am your wife now. I won't leave your side. Also, I cannot bear to leave Kuno without her father, even for a short amount of time. So, we are coming with you to Kuo. You won't be alone, Issei. Yusaka's smile changes into a small look of concern. This was because Issei stared back at her in absolute shock. His eyes were wide and his expression was that of someone who might have just seen a ghost. Then, a single tear fell from Issei's left warm and brown eye. Before Yusaka could make sense of it all, she suddenly felt Issei's arms around her. Looking down, Yusaka's expression of concern slowly changed into a warm and loving smile. Issei had his face buried in her shoulder as he completely broke down. A plethora of emotions were making their way to the surface of Issei's heart. Though he was crying, the Red Dragon Emperor of Domination was the happiest man on the entire planet, as far as he was concerned. Sona, Seraphal, Yusaka, each of you said the same thing to me. You said you won't leave me. I just don't understand. Why am I crying right now? This is the greatest thing I could ask for. I got my harem, so why then, partner? Isn't it obvious by now? The drag, um, I don't understand. Still thick in the head, I see. Very well, let me spell it out for you. Okay, anytime then, Mr. Know-it-all. You have always been thinking with that little head of yours for far too long now. I suppose I should be grateful considering the circumstances, but you, Issei Hiyoto, are in love. What? Instantly, Issei was drawn from his thoughts the moment he realized that his mouth was being kissed by Yusaka. At first, the teen's eyes were wide with surprise, however those warm and brown eyes began to relax and eventually close as the long kiss continued. Once the kiss finally ended, Yusaka backed away every so slightly while maintaining a very warm and blushy smile. Yes, the drag is correct. You are indeed, in love, darling. Now, do me a favor and keep those arms of yours, around. Me, Yusaka placed her arms around Issei's shoulders and pulled him in even more. Nodding, the team did what he was asked. I can't keep anything from you, can I? Yusaka begins to laugh heartily. Foo 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 foo, era era, I am so glad that you are finally realizing that. Unable to help himself, Issei began to laugh as well. Ha 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 ha, yup, he he, I'm kinda dense sometimes. Instantly, Issei's arm began to glow in shades of emerald and crimson. All say, looking down at his arm, Issei formed a tick mark. Quiet you, seen, Yusaka castle, geez, they've been gone for a while now. I don't see why we couldn't have gone along. I hear that Beppu, Oita has some of the best hot springs in all of Japan. Sona was sitting on one of the couches in the large living den area. She had a very serious demeanor while she played with her glasses in one hand. Oh, come now, so tan, everyone gets to have their alone time with darling Kuhn. Seraphal was sitting next to her sister on the couch while kicking her feet back and forth in a childish manner. Still, I don't like the fact that she can just, I don't know, spirit him away to who knows where. I mean, what if something happens? Then what? Sona was nodding to herself at her own statement. She's a fox, Sona. Spriting others away, it's kind of their thing, you know. Besides, don't us devils do the same thing? I mean, teleportation circles, right? And to answer your last question, Satan, she is Yusaka of Kyoto. I don't mean to brag about my childhood friend, but let's just say that Issei is probably the safest devil on planet Earth right now. Seraphal now nods to herself. 
Tsubaki, who was sitting on the opposite couch, had none other than little Kuno on her lap. The queen of the sea tree peerage was repeatedly patting the little fox princess's ears and head. Meanwhile, Kuno was taking it all in, smiling warmly and enjoying the pats. President, Serifal Sama, might I interject and ask about something that's been on my mind? Tsubaki had her usual stoic features however there was a hint of importance behind her stoicism. Sona looks across and toward her queen. Naturally, speak your mind. Serifal nods playfully. What's up Tsubaki-chan? When we arrive back in Kuo, what will be the plan of action regarding Hyodo? Tsubaki waited for a reply while using her free hand to reach for a cup of tea that was placed on the coffee table. Serifal looked back at Sona and frowned. Placing her glasses back onto her head, Sona thought for a moment. I won't let him be alone with Rias. No, she's caused far too much damage to him. Serifal's frown turned into a very warm smile. Satan, Sona shakes her head in an angry manner. No, Rias cannot get her way this time. I won't allow it. Kuno throws one of her hands up in the air while showing a look of disdain. Don't let that mean red hurt Papa. Please. Sona looks back at Kuno, seeing he fire in her golden eyes. She really cared about Issei. Showing a small and half smile, Sona nodded back at the fox princess. Strangely enough, Kuno returned the nod. There was clearly some kind of exchange of respect going on between the fox and the devil. Everyone began to look around the room as the lights all began to flicker wildly. Oh, speak of the devil, or rather, the fox, hee hee. Serifal began to kick her legs with more intensity in her usual childish fashion. Near the corridor of the main lobby, a large and multicolored portal began to manifest. As this was happening, most of the party that were sitting in the den, all stood up and made their way closer toward this strange amalgamation of color and light. After some time went by, a large and sudden flash took over the entire hallway. Now remember to breathe this time, darling. Yasaka emerged from the portal, with Issei, as his arm was placed around the queen's shoulder. After another blinding flash, the portal of rainbows completely disappeared without a trace. Sona was smiling brightly however she caught herself and proceeded to maintain her usual composure. Serifal was clapping her hands excitedly while jumping up and down. Kuno was watching her aunt with some excitement of her own as she began to clap as well. Tsubaki leaned against the corridor entrance way and quietly watched. Fiu. Issei released and took in another large gulp of air. Huff, Fiu. Cough, cough. Hey, okay, yeah, that was a much better trip than the first time. Issei was smiling though he looked a tad bit pale in the face. Yasaka smiled and nodded. I am glad you took my instruction to heart, husband Kuhn. Issei felt a sudden pressure on his left leg. Looking down, none other than Kuno was hugging him. Welcome home, Papa Kuno. Did you like the hot springs? Kuno looked especially happy at the moment. Oh yes, your mother and I had a great time. It was one of the most relaxing places I've ever been, truthfully. Issei showed a serious intent behind his smile. Kuno giggled. Yup, it's really fun. I like to go there in the winter time. It gets so foggy, so neat. Issei laughed a bit and patted the princess on her head. He then looked around the room and his eyes stopped on Sona. Prez, I mean, Sona. Hey. Yasaka released Issei's arm while using one of her tails to push the team closer toward Sona. Meanwhile, Sona tried to maintain her stoicism while attempting a simple nod. That was until Issei, who understood why Yasaka was pushing him, proceeded to hug Sona, rather tightly. Even with Kuno attached to his leg, the teen managed to embrace his girlfriend. Sona's features softened into that of a woman that was in love. Issei, I missed you. Sona spoke in a very soft voice with a hardly noticeable decibel level. Nodding, Issei replied in his own soft and subtle voice. You too, Sona, I missed you too. Remembering her declaration from earlier, Sona immediately tightened her arms around Issei. Hyodo, Erm, Issei. Don't worry about Rias, don't even have a second thought regarding her. You see, I am not going to let her hurt you again. So, is it alright if I am at your side, you know, for when you confront her? Feeling the sting of that same emotion he had back at Beppu, Oida, Issei reciprocated Sona's tight embrace with one of his own. Thank you, Sona. Closing his eyes, Issei just stayed like that for a while. 
Meanwhile, Kuno found herself being pried off of Issei by her mother. All right now, sweetheart, we need to get some essentials packed up. Also, I need to speak with the servants and guards. After all, traveling is never a stressless task, era era. Seraphal, Kuno, Tsubaki and now, Sona, all give their undivided attention to Yasaka. The Leviathan Mao raises her hand as if she were in school. Yasaka Tan, Yasaka Tan. Seraphal was now jumping up and down again while showing pure excitement in her mannerisms. Placing a sleeve over her mouth, Yasaka begins to giggle. Foo 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 foo. Well, you see, just like you, Sona dear, my daughter and I will be living with Issei, in Kuo. Seraphal's jaw drops as her arm falls to her side. What? Kuno screams with absolute glee. Yay, mommy, thank you. Kuno is now attached to her mother's leg. Thank you, thank you. Chapter 44, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 44, Home. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Kyoto, Japan. In the large den area of the castle, Tsubaki, Tsubasa, Momo, Ruruko, Saji, Reya and Tomo were standing in a group, all with their bags and suitcases in hand. Toward the hallway corridor, which connected to the family den, Seraphal and Issei were hugging one another, standing only feet from the couple were Sona, Kuno and a blushing Yasaka. Just like the peerage in the other room, they all had an assortment of suitcases and other traveling items. Sona was doing her best to ignore the scene that was only feet from her very eyes. With that, she proceeded to double-check her baggage, just to make sure nothing was missing. As that was going on, Yusaka was also checking some of her daughter's belongings, mainly to make sure she had her toothbrush packed. Seraphal whispers into Issei's ear, all while showing some unusual and somewhat erotic mannerisms. So, it's just as my little sister said. Issei, you got three tough girls in your life, doesn't that make you H-A-P-P-Y? The Mao then proceeds to playfully bite the flustered teen's ear. Nam. Issei makes a rather high-pitched moan which gathers everyone's attention. This gathers everyone's attention, including the sea tree peerage, as they begin to approach in curiosity. Seraphal begins to laugh very loudly. Issei. Is that for me? Grinning. Seraphal removes one of her arms from Issei's shoulder and proceeds to point down toward the teen's crotch area. Ah shit. Issei immediately pulls away from Seraphal while he covers his crotch region with both hands. No, that was just, um, damn it, why do you have to be so loud, Milky? Sona is staring at Issei with a frustrated look and then proceeds to facepalm. Perverted Baka, Yasaka has both of her hands over Kuno's eyes as the Fox Queen blushes heavily. As the rest of the peerage make their way into and through the corridor, the first thing they notice is Issei who looks to be doing some kind of strange dance while his hands cover his crotch area. As this was going on, Seraphal was laughing heartily, Sona continued to facepalm, Yasaka continued to blush and little Kuno, still with her mother's hands over her eyes, twitched her ears, as to possibly hear whatever she can't see. Hyodo, what's going on, dude? Saji was now pointing toward a rather grumpy and flustered looking Issei. None of your business, whip boy. Realizing that it was finally safe to remove his hands, Issei took a deep breath while his expression slowly formed into a grin. Or would you rather I call you, Mr. Airborne? Some of the room snickered a bit however Saji showed a grin of his own. At least I ain't the guy getting in trouble for peeping on the kendo club girls with those two dweebs. Momo and Ruruka both made, ooh, sounds as they looked back toward Issei while each was shaking her head, emphasizing disappointment. Issei thought deeply at some sort of comeback, however he was interrupted by Yasaka, who was now clearing her throat. Ahem, everyone, please settle down. I am going to open one of my special gateways and hull you along with me. Seraphal has told me that most of you are extremely capable of creating magical barriers, yes, era. Every member of Sona's peerage nodded. Very good. So, Instead of having to take the train and pay tickets along with all of the inconveniences that go along with long-distance travel, well, I've decided to make things easier. One thing though, Issei can attest to what I am about to tell you. We will be traveling through a spiritual realm that is quite deadly to most. Therefore, a barrier would be sufficient to protect you from the parallel space within this dimension. After you create a barrier around your group, I will have Kuno here, pull you along. 
Yasaka gracefully points toward her daughter and makes a slight bow. Kuno meanwhile, stretches her arms into the air while looking to be in a very happy mood. Don't worry, you guys, I've gone through mom's portals a hundred billion times. I may look tiny, but I'm a fox. Era era, yes you are, my, darling. Yasaka pats her daughter on the head. Oh and Issei, sweetheart, you know the drill. You and I travel together. Issei immediately begins to form sweat drops on his forehead as his features now suggest a hint of fear. Oh, goody, Issei smiles nervously. Oh, era era, I see. Well, I can make it even easier than the last time. We can talk about the details in a moment. Alrighty then, I am starting, please gather close and form a barrier. Yasaka's tails began to make a strange dance that formed into circular patterns. Nodding, Sona and Seraphal both walk toward the center of the room as the peerage gathers around them. After a few glances in between peerage members, each of them held out their arms and slowly, a translucent and glowing blue shield of magic, surrounded the entire group in a spherical shape. Yasaka nods. Good, very good. Kuno, take hold of the devil chans and kun please. Issei, darling, come to me, sweetheart. I will now explain an easier method in spectral travel in order to ease your temporary suffering. Issei shuddered at hearing his name but then slowly and apprehensively, he walked toward his wife. Once he was within hugging distance, Yasaka smiled warmly. All right, I don't think you will mind this method, era era. Yasaka proceeded to instantly take hold of Issei's shoulders and back with both of her arms. While this was happening, all nine of the fox queen's tails suddenly wrapped themselves around the entirety of Issei's body, minus his head. Between the busty bosoms of Yasaka was now the restrained teen's face, snuggled firmly in the fox queen's cleavage. Meanwhile, Kuno was wrapping the spherical shield, which contained Seraphal, Sona and her entire peerage, in a golden thread of magic, which she had manifested from thin air. Okay, all done, mom, we're ready. As Yasaka tightened her tails around a no longer struggling Issei, her smile faded into an expression of seriousness. All right, Kuno, great job, little one. Issei, just stay put and don't move, understand? Issei, who felt nothing but the silk-like fur of Yasaka's tails and her warm breasts in his face nodded. Looking up, seemingly at her ceiling, the fox queen closes her eyes and begins a mantra. Kyoto no dai rei rein yo, kitekudasai. Hayado no iee no suro o ite kudasai. Kyoto no yasaka no tame ni koro adi kudasai. Instantly, the electrical lighting within the castle began to fluctuate in periods of dim and bright. As this was going on, what looked to be a rip in space and time, began to manifest not far from Yusaka. Bursting with lights of every color imaginable, most would be forced to avert their eyes. Era, all right then, Kuno, let's get going, darling. Issei, don't move, Yasaka nodded to herself as she began to slowly walk forward. Meanwhile, Kuno looked behind her at the bubble full of devils and winked toward them. Here we go, you guys just sit back and let the professionals work. Hee <laughs> hee, Kuno now tugs at her golden thread. This made the spherical shield full of the sea tree group simply float forward and follow the little fox princess, as she followed close behind her mother. Issei was actually shocked, Yusaka was right. He wasn't feeling the crazy terror and dread he felt before. It's true, the second trip wasn't half as bad as the first time, but this was as if he was just cuddling with Yusaka. Issei preferred this method. Oh pie gods, thank you. Seriously, this is like a dream come true. Yusaka boobies. Bounce, bounce, boing, boing. Every step she takes, they bounce. Boobs are the greatest. Ahem. Oh, come on, get out of my head you dumb dragon. Partner, I will ignore that insult for now, but shouldn't you be thinking about what you're going to say to Rias G-R-E-M-O-R-Y? Shit. Scene, Hyodo home, Kuo. Japan. Sitting in the dining room, Mr. and Ms. Hyodo were watching an Enka drama on the small television across from the main table as they shared a large bowl of green tea ice cream. Sitting in the living room was Akino, Asia, Kiba and Kaneko, all with their textbooks in hand, studying silently. Suddenly, Everyone was surprised to hear a knocking sound at the front door. Akino stood from the couch she was sitting on. Um, I'll get the door. Asia was a little upset that Akino beat her to it, especially since she knew that Issei could be back any day now. 
It's been a dismal week for the group as they had no motivation to really do anything. So, aside from lounging around the house, Akino made it a point to have the peerage catch up on their individual assignments from school, this was one of those study sessions. Kaneko eventually realized the difference in her peerage, without the Hyoto pervert around. Though she wouldn't admit to it, in her own way, she missed the pawn. Kiba was more concerned about his king and his teammate. He's practically spent the entire week, inside of his own head, coming up with different possible scenarios and how he would react to each situation. Opening the front door, Akino took a step back at what she saw. It was Issei. It was Issei but he wasn't alone. Why was Sona Sitri and Seraphal Leviathan with him? As if that wasn't enough, there happened to be a tall and very voluptuous woman, wearing a kimono with long blonde hair and fox ears and, are those tails. Looking down, Akino, already in shock, noticed a smaller version of this fox woman. Shorter fox girl, Issei waved at Akino while smiling nervously. Hello, Akino, good to see you. At the sound of what clearly was Issei's voice, the rest of the Grimori peerage dash from the furniture in the living room and make their way toward the front door. Suddenly, all three of the Grimori devils stop in their tracks while freezing in place. Asia, Kaneko and Kiba, all tilt their heads at the scene in front of them. Standing on the left side of Issei was Sona. On the team's right was Seraphal. Standing in front of the three were Yusaka and Kuno. Kuno waved back toward the Grimori peerage while smiling. Yusaka made a slight bow with her trademark crescent-shaped smile. Sona looked back at her sister and the two nodded to each other with determined expressions. Issei, is that you, Mrs. Hyodo ran toward the front door along with Mr. Hyodo. Issei released Seraphal's hand in order to nervously rub the back of his head. Yeah, I'm back. Both of Issei's parents made their way through Akino, Kiba, Asia and Kaneko. Instantly, Mrs. and Mr. Hyodo stopped in their tracks the moment they noticed their son, surrounded by women and a little girl. Issei, um, would you please introduce us to your new, um, friends? Mr. Hyodo was now the one rubbing the back of his head, clearly this was a genetic nervous tick coming from the father's line. Yusaka makes a very formal bow. Oh my, Mr. and Mrs. Hyodo, greetings and good evening, or should I say, Otusan and Okasan. The fox queen places her kimono sleeve to her lips and giggles momentarily. Foo foo foo, ahem, please excuse me, this is so embarrassing, era era. Well, my name is Yusaka and this is my daughter, Kuno. I am your son's wife and this is your granddaughter. Issei froze up like a very stressed out statue. Seraphal and Sona once again looked at each other with suggestive glances. Again, the two sisters nod. Sona proceeds to squeeze Issei's hand which was still in hers. At the same time, Seraphal placed an arm around Issei's side and gave him a supporting side hug. Sona whispers as her look of concern is obvious. Relax, Baka, they are your parents, I'm sure they will under. Sona was cut off the moment. Mrs. Hyodo took hold of Yusaka's hands and held them in her own. Yusaka-san is it, oh dear, you are so drop-dead gorgeous. Mrs. Hyodo's attitude changed when she glanced back at her son. She now had a look of suspicion. What did my son do? Did he coerce you into this marriage? Were you forced, sweetheart? You can tell me, I wouldn't put something like that past Issei. Mr. Hyodo finally picked his jaw back up from and off of the floor. Getting a hold of himself, Issei's father places his hands on his wife's shoulders. Honey. Yusaka simply shook her head in a very slow and graceful manner. No, mother, I assure you, Issei is perfect. There is nothing wrong with him and he certainly did not blackmail me into anything. To be honest, it was I who approached your son. Yusaka then nods to herself while maintaining her smile. Mrs. Hyodo takes a moment for the information to sink in. Then, oh, I see. So, you are my daughter-in-law. And this, Issei's mother looks down at the cute little Kuno, who was staring back at her with her large and golden eyes. And you, Kuno, is it? The little fox princess nervously smiles and nods. A a a a a a h h h h h. Come here. Yusaka's hands were released as Mrs. Hyodo crouched down and reached for a very surprised looking Kuno. As Issei's mother was hugging the little fox princess with absolute vigor, Mrs. Hyodo began to cry tears of joy. 
Look, Duro, sniff sniff, we have a granddaughter. Wah, Kuno was being shaked and hugged by Issei's mother and had a look of complete confusion. Meanwhile, Issei's father took a moment to look at each of the girls at the door and then looked down toward his wife and his new granddaughter. I see, well, this will make for one interesting discussion. How about all of you come in, we can talk in the dining room. Mr. Hyodo then pointed his hand in the direction of the kitchen area. Silently, the Grimori peerage moved from the hallway and into the dining room along with Issei and his entourage. Meanwhile, Mrs. Hyodo picks up Kuno and carries her down the hallway as the little fox princess blushes heavily. One again, Mr. Hyodo rubs the back of his head and then closes the front door. Scene Unknown Location NYA, it's my sister. Kuroka had both of her hands on the purple-colored viewing orb as the Nako devil's expression was that of longing. Ophis, who was leaning back against a pillow, simply tilted her head in a questioning expression. Sister, Nako, you have a sibling. Kuroka nods quietly and uses one of her hands to point at the little white-haired girl who stood emotionless at the dining table. She is Kaneko, my precious little sister. So, she's a slave of the Grimori house. Ophis, I need to get her. Tilting her head the other way, Ophis thinks for a moment. Then after a few seconds, Ophis speaks in her usual emotionless voice. Nako, I will help you. You've been assisting me in explaining concepts that are meaningless to me, so I will help you retrieve your sibling. But you must be patient. Your sister, Kaneko, the two of you will be reunited when I make my move to take the Hyodo boy. Kuroka shifted her attention now to the infinite dragon god. Smiling brightly, Kuroka replied softly. You, you mean it. You'll help me get my sister back. Ophis nods emotionlessly. Then something happened. Ophis was being hugged, rather tightly, by a whimpering Kuroka. Not knowing how to handle this situation, as Ophis has never been hugged, let alone touched, the Ouroboros dragon simply sat still with a vacant expression. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.